And, uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm George Garvey. I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs. Uh, Dean Miles uh, is sorry she couldn't be here today. She's off in Tennessee uh, uh, doing uh, law school business. So, uh, uh, so I have the pleasure of, uh, of welcoming you, uh, and, uh, and I'm going to turn it over to the head of the, the guild to introduce our, our speaker today. I just want to tell you, uh, I gave the uh, Mary Mirror of Justice talk quite a few years ago, uh, and it was an event that I'm still very proud of, uh, uh, the recognition and uh, uh, the uh, need, the inspiration to do research in an area that's significant to the mission of the university. So uh, uh, I'm a proud uh, recipient of the, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, crystal uh, uh, thing uh, <laughs> with my name on it and uh, others on the faculty have been. And, uh, and uh, I'm not going to introduce Professor Scully, but I'll I, I do want to acknowledge I can't imagine anyone more deserving on our faculty than uh, Professor Scully. So with that, let me turn over to, uh, to uh, Mary Rummery, who will uh, do the formal introduction of, uh, uh, of our speaker today. Thank you. Good afternoon. Professor Scully is an amazing example of a Catholic lawyer and has been since she graduated from this very law school in 1967. She came from a close and loving family of five children in Massachusetts before moving to Washington, D.C. She brought with her an amazing selfless dedication toward making a difference for those who were less fortunate. Pre Professor Scully credits the love and living examples of her parents for the confidence that guided her through this time when only two other women were in her year group. Their example stayed with her as she pursued a career in service, at first by managing her duties at the Justice Department while finding time to volunteer at legal services, and later when she obtained a competitive position at one of the nine legal service locations in Washington, D.C. She was then approached by CUA to take a position at the Columbus Community Legal Services, and though it was a big change to move from the immediate connection with clients offered by her position at legal services, to teaching students to advocate for those in need in a supervisory role, Professor Scully pursued the change with continued dedication and compassion. Professor Scully has been a model of unwavering care and commitment for 36 years of law students through the clinic and a continuing champion for low-income residents within the community. This is demonstrated by her service on the Task Force on Racial and Ethnic Bias and the Task Force on Gender Bias within the court. She was recognized by the D.C. Bar Foundation's Gerald Scout Award and the D.C. Law Student and Court Program's Lever Award for her leadership and service in improving legal services available to low-income residents in the District of Columbia. When a former student was asked to characterize their fondest or most enduring clinic memory, they simply stated, Ellen Scully, do I need to say anything else? So I don't need to say anything else, and it is my honor and pleasure to present Professor Ellen Scully. Well, um, I do want to thank the Guild for this honor, um, but I also want to make the point, I love being on it. I love people to say nice things about me. <laughs> and, you know, it's really great, but when it has to do with my work, it really isn't just about me. And so, you know, everybody in this room knows we need prompts. So I just want to remind you that really this is about Columbus Community Legal Services. And just to help you all remember that, I got one of our teachers. And I am terrified because I'm, I so want to make this so it's accessible to everybody. but. Most of it's through my lens, and that's going to maybe present some problems. But let me try and stick to my notes, and uh, let me start. I really do want to thank the Guild of Catholic Lawyers, because I think the recognition that you give me, and therefore the Columbus Community Legal Services, is special, and I think uh, appropriate. It's our 40th anniversary. 
Um, and on a very personal note, the absolute pleasure of doing my research, George, into a place that I've worked at for a good length of its existence uh, has been really quite stunning. I'd forgotten a lot of what we had accomplished over the years, and it's really been almost a luxurious mandate to do that kind of research into uh, the work of Columbus Community Legal Services. Um, when I was uh, approached by about this uh, honor, one of the suggestions was to think about what difference it made that the Columbus School of Law was located in the Catholic University it's law school, the Columbus Community Legal Services. And I can tell you that I want everybody to draw their own conclusions, but I think I'll lay out some of the reasons that I think it uh, very definitely shaped the, the uh, structure, the way, the, the emphasis of what the clinic did, and uh, made Columbus Community Legal Services, I hope, one of the real wonderful, sorry, I don't think this goes with an orange t-shirt. It <laughs> <laughs> makes it uh, reflective of what I think is unique and stunning about this law school. Um, and, I, and when the clinic started, there's a little bit of a dispute. My shirt says 1969. We honor it as 1970. But I think we can quibble about that unnecessarily so because obviously it took several years of design and planning and fundraising before it got to be located within the community uh, the, of uh, the people that we worked with. Um, and I think that's the first clue of the emphasis of, that is brought to Columbus Community Legal Services by virtue of its location within the Catholic University School, Columbus School of Law. Um, and, and I, just to make that point, it was designed with very much service in mind. And I, I'm not making this up. In fact, this is the part of my comments that are based on research so that they have not just through my filter. And Roger Wolf, who was one of the original uh, directors of the clinic, uh, participated in a conference that was hosted by the Council on Legal and Professional Responsibility if I got that right, it's the Klepper Foundation anyhow. And they brought together people who were involved in uh, issues involving clinical le legal education or education of law students as well as issues of professional responsibility and presented working papers. It was quite a stunning group. And Roger, in, in his remarks, talked about, the, I'm quoting him now when I say, by locating its clinic in a neighborhood away from the school, the law school acknowledged its obligation to service as well as to the education and committed itself to an involvement in the community. And I think that that's very much at the core of what we can, uh, the Catholic University uh, mission and also what the law school is about. Now let me just, for those of you in the room that didn't live through the early, late 60s and 70s and some of you that have learned about it, um, let me just bring, it was a time of great turbulence. It was a time of horrible things were going on. There was a, we had the Vietnam War, we had so many awful things. But there was, I think, one thing that emerged that was really quite good, and that was, I think, the absolute focus on the burden that the poor, disproportionate, extraordinarily disproportionate burden that the poor and the disadvantaged uh, suffered as a result, were under in, in our country, our wealthy country. Um, and the response to that was, was certainly uh, there. I mean, the students, there were a lot of different responses, but I'm going to focus on the response of, of students at Catholic University. Even before the, the clinic got started, because the students felt that there had to be a way to take their learning experience and combine it with doing for the community, with service. And that was the mandate or the demand or however we want to describe it that they brought to the school and uh, administrators and faculty. And the response was what, what Roger described. The response was to say, yes, we'll figure out how to do that because, of course, that would be what we should be about and it will add value to the education. It wasn't an easy task. 
There was time where there was a lot of fundraising that took place. There certainly was planning, I wouldn't say a lot of fundraising, but there were some funds that were raised. But there was a lot of planning that went into the design. And just for those of you that, that don't know this, that prior to that, students were out in the community. They weren't getting academic credit for it, but they were working at the local legal services program and also at a building on 11th Street that uh, was the home of one of the faculty members at the time, Father Broderick, but also part of that was being used to provide services to the community. And so they actually worked out a formal agreement with Neighborhood Legal Services um, that was being, uh, and well, I won't go into all the details because of course they're not necessary. Sorry, I get kind of enamored with them. Um, that uh, would be a place where they would then operate. So for a year or so, as best I can figure out, they worked out of, for no academic credit, but nonetheless had their, their feet firmly planted in the community already. And so drawing on that and drawing on the model of service that is so consistent with that of, of the Catholic Church in solidarity with people, that, that that's, I think, why of all the designs that could have been picked, some a lot less uh, demanding of resources and kind and all the rest, the, the choice was to create a neighborhood law office within the community. And I think, although it's not that I found it necessarily articulated anywhere, but with the realization that the learning would be a two-way street, that the students would learn from the clients, the clients would learn from the students, and there'd be a great deal of learning that would go on among and with everyone. And, and indeed, that is what happened. Now, I w can take no credit for the design. I'm still in awe of it. I think the brilliance of people that can step back and, and think about these things and, and, and respond to the time is, is, is a, a skill not to, uh, to be, uh, well, that I would love to have. Um, what it did all, is this, sorry, my, I should have done this in a more orderly fashion and my papers wouldn't be slipping. Um, but, but what I want to say is that the, uh, everybody that attends this law school, everybody that works here, people that have part, in any way, shape, or form have a part of the law school, are a part of Columbus Community Legal Services. It's a, it's a major commitment of the law school. It is a commitment in resources, it's a commitment in support, it is a, across the board. And in my understanding, it was embraced, uh, that the, the, the university supported it. In fact, I remember being told that uh, the uh, university proudly reported it in the, its annual report to the bishops that there was this entity called Columbus Community Legal Services located within the community providing the kind of services that was so sorely needed and getting back in kind the learning and the exchange that went on, uh, something that the church could be well aware of. Um, the thing I want to try and do today is demonstrate or at least try and talk a little bit about what it was like uh, in, in the different locations that it inhabited. I worried that maybe people would think that uh, by using location, 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 that people would think that I was still wanting to be back on North Capitol Street because some of you may know that my heart has been there often. But um, it is not the case. It seems to me this is exactly where we should be and how lucky we are. But how lucky we were at the time when it was a different time, when, for one thing, law school was a lot less expensive, um, and that was a factor in how people viewed what they were able to do with their time and what they wanted to get out of it. Um, and in addition, uh, it was a time when we weren't as conscious of, of credits, a, a number of things. So let me explain to you how they first started. It was located off campus uh, in the North Capitol Street. As I recall, it was originally in the 1400 block. As I said, I wasn't there. They were rented initially. And um, I would occasionally intersect with people from the clinic because at that time I was working, as Mary said, at the Neighborhood Legal Services Program. And I would, um, it'd be hard to tell the lawyers from the 
from the students, frankly. I mean, it, it intersect with them at, sometimes at uh, the city council, and a student would be testifying, and I would think it was maybe one of the lawyers, um, or in court or other places. Um, and, uh, but, but I was not aware of it except from what I've been able to read and discover in my research. They started out very modestly with three credits, uh, was all that you could take it for. Um, and then they gradually expanded that, and then they really expanded it so that you could only take it for the entire academic course load for a semester. So you took nothing else but the clinic. And that they were constantly trying to think of ways to be sure that they could meet the service commitment they were making by being located in the community. That then got tinkered with again, and people would then sometimes take it for six credits one semester and seven another. But always trying to figure out what kinds of cases, may, initially the cases that the clients brought. Um, it didn't take long for them to figure out the two people, because in the beginning, actually it was one person when it started out on campus, Dick Carter. It then, when it um, was on North Capitol Street, Roger Wolf and Tony Kramer were co-directors, but two people couldn't do it because the need for supervision, the need to ensure that the students were able to meet the, the requirements. And as good as they were, there was still a need to make sure that you had um, supervision from, from lawyers. And so they approached the school, uh, and the school agreed that two more positions should be added, uh, not faculty positions, but rather people that would be involved in supervision. And, and I happen to be one of them. Um, it moved from there to, um, well, Tony Kramer remained the director. Roger moved up on campus, teaching full-time and also with Tony, teaching the classroom component that went along with the clinic. Because throughout its entire history, there's always been a rigorous uh, a classroom component adapting to the needs and times. Um, and that exists, some of you in the room know that even to today. Um, and. I can tell you, maybe it would help for some of you if I just laid out a picture of the building on North Capitol Street, unless one of my colleagues wants to. Um, of course, I had the nicest office, but, and I did. There's no question about it, but I, I will tell you I came to it honestly. Um, we bought that building with a grant from the Meyer Foundation, oh, and that happened before I was there too. I take, only I, that I can report it to you. I can take no credit. Um, and so you walk in the, the door, the one door to the clinic, and to the right is a rather large room. Now remember, it's a converted townhouse on North Capitol Street. It's not enormous by any stretch, but um, it, and it had been converted by the prior occupant, who I think lived in part of it and um, ran his real estate business out of the rest of it. But at any rate, it came in in this big, fairly large-sized room that housed the uh, two sec the secretaries and the, and the office manager. And there was a sort of narrow space in back of the, the, I don't even know what it could have been, but at any rate, it housed the files. Uh, I hate to say it, but there were no copying machines. They didn't exist at our clinic. They did exist. Uh, we got them. <laughs> We got a mimeograph machine thrown in by the, the person who sold the building to us, um, and a copier came later, and all sorts of equipment came later. But in the beginning, carbon paper and uh, people that could type unbelievably well, and uh, then two offices in addition to the large one, a small interview room. Of course, the clients were waiting uh, in the same big room with the secretaries, and then one other room which became Catherine's office for some time, um, and uh, had a unique capacity to flood. Um, but, uh, and then you would come back out, go up stairs that were somewhat irregular and very steep, or at least the steps in between, and you get up to the second floor which housed smallish office, a library, and then my office, but which I shared with the other person who was hired when they added two people, because we thought the combined efforts would produce uh, more you know, substantial results, the collaborative supervision model, which it was. Uh, it turned out that that just became unwor unworkable because of the demand. Um, and so ultimately, when he left, I got the office. And then you went up another set of stairs, and that housed the student space, three open spaces, uh, 
Ultimately, one had to be taken over as we expanded, but three open spaces uh, where the students worked at, at tables quite close to each other um, and learned from their experiences with their clients and from their colleagues' experience with the clients, which is somewhat what we tried to build into the design of the space we now have rather than cubby holes or the like. Um, and uh, as, as I said, as we expanded, the students lost a space and uh, uh, and in, I think, well, at a certain point, a former student came to us. She had the, the attention to domestic violence was emerging. And it was uh, becoming very clear that the, that the need was uh, substantial and had to be addressed by, by the bar and by, by legal services providers. And Rita Bank, who was a former member of the clinic, uh, had gotten a number of grants that allowed her to be one of the first people really in the city to focus on that issue. Uh, but part of the grants were that she would get a place to work out of. And the hope was that maybe some of the grants, that that would expand into something more permanent. And so she approached us, and in return for space overhead, um, she then became folded into the clinic with what was then called the Family Abuse Project. Uh, and Catherine succeeded uh, reader in that. Um, so there was all this activity responding to all the needs of the community and with a very broad caseload, and then try, housing being a major part of that. And so what were some of the accomplishments at the time? I, I mean, what worries me is the time. I want to get us out of here fast. But I have to tell you, it, it's amazing looking back. We weren't smart. I take responsibility for this, although when, I, uh, well, at a certain point I became the director, I will say that, um, but not because I was a good administrator. Um, I had had time at, in doing administration, and I knew that my skill set and administration were not really a, na a natural match. But what I did know is that my passion and commitment to what was clearly a wonderful model a stellar model, I thought, for clinical education, uh, warranted my figuring out how to, what to do. So one thing that I decided early on was you surround, you get people that are smarter and brighter and better than you, and you work together, and you draw on your, your strengths and weaknesses, and we all have them. And that was really another piece that I think was uh, came from the sort of spirit of and, and the influence of the uh, mission of, of the university and of the law school. So um, the, the people that have been assembled over the years that have been lucky enough to get paid for being at the clinic um, were people who came from with, with an enormous amount of talent and strengths, and we functioned as a unit. Uh, and that is why I could never, ever uh, take credit for, and would never, would it be appropriate in, in an undertaking like the clinic to think that any one person was more instrumental than anybody else. We just pooled our talents in an extraordinarily wonderful way. Now, I, I did have some, um, I take some pride in the fact that I got to hire some of the people and their talents were just quite readily apparent. Um, and. Uh, so the clinic ran as a collaborative uh, operation uh, doing extraordinary things. Um, let me just try and highlight a few of them for you. Um, first, from the vantage point of the students and what the students have done over the years. I had a whole list of quotes and a lot of other things that I wanted to share with you, but I became aware of the fact that you really had to experience it to be totally uh, comfortable, not comfortable, but aware of what was going on. One of the things that I do take responsibility for, and I'm rushing, I'm sorry, uh, is the fact that I wish I had realized history and going forward and had done the things that Catherine, who's now the director, and Alveda have done in terms of preserving and getting a, people to record their experiences so you wouldn't be relying on a lecture like this to hear about a place that, uh, that so many people participated in. 
that you're hearing it through my filter. Um, I'm selected because I've been there the longest and I have, the, I have a relationship with a wonderful place. But um, I did think of three things that I wanted to share besides telling you a bit about the student's experience. So let me just make sure I get this one to you all right away. The clinic's been in existence for 40 years. And by my count during that time, we've had 16 people in staff. That's a, for, for secretarial positions and for office manager, it's a very low turnover in a highly stressful atmosphere because the support staff have to, they have to, they don't get to control what they do. Now I'm not saying we as the lawyers and supervisors and students got to have a lot of control because it's a pretty much a reactive setting. But the people that have the least control are the support staff. And yet we have had people leave, but generally because they were moving out of state or illness or something. So I think that says something about the place. The, the, by my count, not counting, to temporary uh, people that were filling in. The faculty, there's been, I think, 18 or 19 of us over this time, and we now have eight slots. So again, I think that speaks to how much the solidarity, the importance of the mission, and like, uh, uh, maybe those statistics don't resonate, but it seems to me that, that they warrant it when you think of four decades. Um, so what were the students doing during this time? Uh, in the early years on North Capitol Street um, when they didn't have to take any other courses. Uh, well, they were doing a lot. Uh, it was very varied. Um, they were handling trials. They were doing all the things that you all are doing today, um, but perhaps in a little more expansive way because of their circumstances. Um, they were also interacting probably more with the community on a daily basis as they would come down to the North Capitol Street setting. And uh, that made it a bit easier, I think, for the students at the time to, to immediately connect and have a sense of the community. Uh, the one time the place really looked great on the outside, anyhow, was when President Reagan was going to Children's Hospital and they came and cleaned the streets and, and, and maybe looked beautiful because there was some thought that it would always look nice for the president. Uh, and then all the pretty glass that they sprinkled along the sides and everything cut in the mulch all, it got ugly again. But um, it gave students, I think, a, a step up maybe in understanding the, by being located in a, in a community that is, reflects low income, understanding what, a little bit of what clients would go through. There was a good Chinese restaurant on the corner, I guess, that saved us a bit. But for the most part, it was, it reflected that. Um, the the uh, faculty evolved over time. We added a number of programs. But, but during these, this early time, I think probably we were struggling with trying to figure out how to make sure that we control the caseload so that we weren't doing more than was appropriate, but at the same time not turning people away so we weren't seen as a resource within the community. That was a very difficult balance. I'm not sure we always struck it quite right, but um, the, the breadth of things that we did, we did a number of jury trials in those days because again, students were doing it for a lot of credits and we're not missing class as a result. I, I remember doing a jury trial with one student who had one suit and one tie, but the trial went on for, for five days. And so the other students lent him a tie. Uh, so each day he did at least have a different tie on. Um, and uh, we went on to win that case and uh, they made the mistake of appealing it and so we won the appeal as well. Um, we didn't do much appellate work. Usually it was when we won and the other side appealed. But um, there were circumstances sometimes when we took on an amicus status. I mean, a lot of times we would file on behalf of the clinic with other legal services providers, uh, amicus briefs. Students would participate in that. I do remember a student arguing an appeal. The issue was somewhat uh, appropriately narrow in, in context and, so, and, and won um, and did a really good job. Um, and I 
remember a lot of things that Catherine and Margaret, Stacy, and all of us here have done that students have participated in. We, ser we served on committees. We still do. And students would come to committees with us or do come to that work with us, often do the work ahead of time with us. Um, and so as we have expanded, I mean, now, taking it to this present day, we do things globally. When I say we, everybody actually but me, I think. But uh, Catherine, is, and with Lear often, is traveling in places that I have to look up on a map. Uh, but bringing this clinical legal education concept uh, to four corners of the globe, because it is so important. But let me just go back to a couple of things. One is that along the way, we had things changed and we had to adopt. Now, I have to say that I think that the, uh, the, the beauty of having a collaborative hierarchy or lack thereof is that, that sometimes when one is not as forefront in, in sort of seeing the need for change or the expansion, others pick it up. So the development of the families in the law clinic very much a product of Margaret and Catherine and Stacy at the time. I, I really wasn't sure I liked it at all, and they knew that. Um, but it was their brilliance that, that, that made it happen, and it was also the result of uh, figuring out how to get around my opposition it's, it's in a way that we still remained very much core collaboratives and, and close colleagues and friends. And I think. That's a piece that I also think reflects just what was at the core of this undertaking in the clinic. Um, we then uh, had expansion in an area that um, the night students went to the faculty. And George, you may remember this, where they demanded an experience like that, that would be compatible with their schedules. And so the advocacy for the elderly program was developed. Um, and uh, with Leah, uh, because the happened at that time, the Legal Services Corporation wanted clinical programs representing the elderly, that population. Uh, so I could tell more details about that, but nonetheless, uh, we did get that grant. It was what is called a terminal grant, uh, which is why we didn't ha spend a lot of time and energy getting grants that would then run out and we would have to figure out what to do with the clients that we might have been representing as a result of these grants. So we were very deliberate in our expansion. We made sure that it was consistent with the mission of service, and we did it in a way that we were looking to how we would make it permanent. So uh, we, we worked a long time on that issue because the original person that we hired left uh, concerned about status. We were concerned about how we were going to make this program last, and ultimately we're fortunate enough to get a commitment to its longevity, even though the details needed to be worked out. And in the interim of working out the details, we felt that we should hire people uh, that had other employment. So Mike McGonagall, along with Sandra McMillan, started, but you were both part-time because we hadn't finalized whether we would have it be permanent. Uh, ultimately, it was. Many other schools were not as fortunate in the support that they were given. And, and I've often thought it was because they didn't have that commitment from their institution towards service. And so making the case to the various deans that I was fortunate enough to deal with as to the limits of soft money and the potential for uh, leaving the client community uh, worse off uh, was was not as difficult as a result, and it, and it bore its fruit. And so we expand we expanded, as I say, deliberately and cautiously, with the commitment to the concept of a of a neighborhood law office. We then uh, had the one point the thought that we were going to become this grand legal services center on North Capitol Street, um, and but as times changed, it became clear that that was not a viable way to go. Um, part of my heart still is on North Capitol Street. Um, and I took a while to adjust, although I think it 
was clearly the route to go, um, and uh, we all have equal offices now, um, and none of them flood as far as I know, although Margaret's is, and Lisa's are not always, uh, the heat isn't always cooperating, but more importantly, we sort of grew with the times. And again, I like to say that my strength of realizing the value of collaborative effort is very reflective in that because that is left to my own devices. I don't think we'd be up here, and I don't think that would be a good thing at all. Um, so uh, I've acknowledged that privately, but now I've acknowledged it publicly, and I wish Ralph was here so he could enjoy that moment um, because he was the dean at the time. And um, he, I would always be saying, you know, we'd left, the, and he would, uh, was in Boston once, and he said, well, you answered the question as to why you leave. And I think that was the breaking point because I could think of all the arguments and I was persuading myself at the same time that I was answering the alum's question. But um, we have uh, done so much and with all the support and input of the uh, university, the law school, the people, I mean, the, the uh, the one quote I will use today as I wind up is um, yesterday, in yesterday's post anyhow, uh, Cardinal Designate Whirl uh, was, was, was uh, at a, uh, I guess it was the ground, not the groundbreaking, but the opening of a 187 unit uh, mixed housing. And he was quoted as saying that all these people came together and contributed what they could, and it's a miracle. Well, I, I don't think the clinic is a miracle. I think the clinic is really the result of a lot of effort from the, from the beginning right through to today. We have students here that you know could be elsewhere right now, and they're sitting here patiently listening, but they have been participating and learning from their clients, I believe, and, and their clients learning from them. Um, and I think that what Catholic University's Columbus Community Legal Services is, is a special place reflective of the mission of the church and the mission of uh, uh, the law school. Everybody's a stakeholder in it, and we hear constantly from alum that still feel totally connected to the clinic. Some people actually married as a result of their time in the clinic. and. Um, it, it is a special place. Um, it attracts special people. So does this law school. Uh, so did it at the time when the clinic was started. Uh, the person that was the dean at the time was Clinton Bamberger. And uh, he spoke at one of our commencements and, and spoke just brilliantly about the, uh, uh, the solidarity with clients and what you get in return. And I think all of us have learned that if we weren't so busy, we might have done a better job at sharing it with people. And if I have a regret, that's it. But um, there's plenty of people in this room that can speak to the clinic presently, and all of us have been here a long time. So I'm really grateful to the Guild for the opportunity to speak uh, and to receive this on behalf of Columbus Community Legal Services, which belongs to all of us. Um, and uh, it's something that I think with some, some separation from it, I think I can say is deserved and we all should be really celebrating it not, and uh, continue to do it for decades to come. So thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Scully. Wonderful, wonderful speech. It is my duty and privilege to give the Mary Mirror of Justice Award to Professor Scully. Very briefly, as the ninth beatitude states, Jesus was advising aspiring politicians. He said, blessed be the brief, for they shall be elected. <laughs> With that in mind, it is my duty now to decrease, because today, Professor Scully shall increase as we are awarding you today. Mary Mirror of Justice. What do we mean by that? Justice, as the great uh, 
Cardinal Newman wrote, who recently was beatified, in this sense refers not to fairness and equality, the typical ideas that come to mind when we talk about justice, but here justice in a more cosmic sense. All the virtues perfectly in unison in one soul. What do we mean by mirror? Well, a mirror reflects. But a mirror never depicts perfectly that which it is reflecting. Mary is the mirror of our Lord, who is divine. Mary is not divine. However, she resembles most closely to our Lord than any other human being who has ever lived. Professor Scully, today you join the ranks of Dean Garvey, Dean Miles, Professors Leary, Perez, and Destro in sharing this award, the Mary Mirror of Justice Award. We give this award to you because your work throughout the years has reflected Mary Mirror of Justice. Without a further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in congratulating Professor Scully, this year's recipient of the Mary Mirror of Justice Award. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let me give one brief announcement. The Guild of Catholic Lawyers on Fridays, on the first Fridays of every month, starting November 5th, will have confessions from 2.30 to 3 o'clock in the chapel. Also on Thursdays at noon, we will pray the Angelus and the Rosary before Mass. So if you would, please join us for those activities. Thank you very much for your presence here this evening. Thank you, Professor Scully. <laughs>